industrial designer by trade, I guess. I graduated from a Pratt and um, uh, immediately was sent, uh, I uh, signed up for Vista. And uh, of course, I signed up only to go to Hawaii. So I wound up in the smallest, uh, roughest Eskimo village in, in Alaska, Sleep Mute, Alaska, for a year. Had a hunt for my food, 50 below zero, unbelievable experience. And uh, from there, I did go to Hawaii and work with the most incredible group of educators that I've ever worked with in my life. And I, I didn't know how great a job it was because it was my first job. I thought things would always get better. Um, they don't necessarily, but I was offered a fellowship at MIT after that for some playgrounds that I had designed where handicapped kids and non-handicapped kids could play as complete sensory equals. And after that, I designed a lot of stuff for different museums, educational games and things for the Discovery Room at the Museum of Natural History, and by invitation, um, a game for the Smithsonian um, uh, on uh, marine archaeology, which was uh, quite an honor. And uh, however, incredibly uh, high class, incredibly low pay. Yes. And um, <laughs> however, Right at that time, unbeknownst to me, the computer came along. And a company called Mattel was getting into this stuff, and educational games just became a, a actual uh, career. So they were flying me out to California, treating me like I was somebody important. So I kept my mouth shut, and I wound up being the director of new concepts uh, like 10 years later at Mattel. I didn't have to do any of the Barbie or that kind of stuff. We worked with uh, uh, Negro Ponte and really some incredible stuff that, that we did that never got into the marketplace. And other things that did, uh, Caleb Chung, who was in our group, um, did Furby, and uh, a lot of different things. And then from there I went to Educational Insights, where I designed the CD-ROM for Geo Safari. And then I uh, started to write children's books, and Random House published one of my books. I drew it, and they liked my illustrations. They thought I was a primitive artist. And uh, that was a nice compliment, ruined forever. <clears throat> and that's, uh, I guess, what I do now. Um, you're right. So, I, and one of the words that I haven't heard a lot about today was story. And, 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 and Warren said that he thought that story was very important in all of the things that you guys are doing. So I guess I'm here today to tell you a story. And uh, it's in a way about, uh, a lot of you are involved with production of things. And I don't know if you've ever had the experience of something going wrong, but you have. This is a story about a big Hollywood studio, Mammoth Studios, who forgot somehow to uh, record one sound effect for a gigantic movie that they're doing. And uh, here it is. It's called Who'll Do the Moo? Copyrights, Dan Resnikoff, all the rights reserved. <laughs> Take mine, Hollywood. Mammoth Studios announced today that they'll be holding open auditions to find someone to do the moo voice for their upcoming musical, Citizen Crane. <laughs> Hollywood insiders say that it's the role of a lifetime, and so, for the next 24 hours, the biggest question in Hollywood is, who'll do the moo? Mr. Big is in his Rolls Royce and he's running kind of late. So the guard just waves him through the Mammoth Studios main gate. He parks his car, runs up the stairs to his secretary's greetings. You've got 20 people on the phone and you're late for all your meetings. And the extras are all rioting on location in Peru. The animals are picketing our photo shoot out at the zoo. The copier is broken. Your coffee's getting cold, Oh, uh, Did I forget to mention you've got Arnold still on hold? Now, his secretary, did I mention that her name was Lynn, said, and Mr. Little needs to see you as soon as you get in. He said to mention to you that he didn't have a clue who or how or when they find someone to do the boo. The boo? I thought they had that solved at least a week ago. You know, somebody in this office absolutely told me so. Ah, Lynn, <laughs> you better get me the whole script down from the shelf. 
If I want something done right here, I gotta do it by myself. And take out ads in both the trades for everyone to see. I mean, the Hollywood Reporter and Variety say, if it's you that do the move, apply for this position tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. at our big open audition. Well, the next day, everyone in town put on their coolest clothes, and they lined up by the thousands outside Mammoth Studios. Ah, well, we missed a little. You see, I have a hunch. We'll find the perfect moor and be out of here by lunch. <laughs> First, in came the rooster. I'm here to make your day. Just show me to, to the sound booth and send those other fools away. Okay, Mr. Rooster, let's just hear you do the move. Well, the rooster stepped up to the mic and he went, Hmm. -a -doo -doo. <laughs> they said, Don't call us. We'll call you. <laughs> Next, in came a big brown dog. I'll help you make your choice. You see, I'm a professional with a very versatile dog voice. Okay, dog, stop bragging. Let's just hear you do your stuff. The dog stepped to the microphone and he went, mm -hmm. <laughs> They said, thank you, we've heard enough. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Little. You want to help me understand how nothing here is going exactly how you planned? How can this be so difficult? All that you have to do is just to find somebody who can do a simple move. Next, then came a duck named Jack. He was very debonair. He danced into the studio looking just like Fred Astaire. Cut the dancing! It's a move that we are interested in, Jack. The duck stepped to the microphone and he went, mm, quack! <laughs> they almost had a heart attack. Well, let me tell you. They listened to a thousand voices. They listened all night long. But everyone who tried to do the move somehow just got it wrong. It's all over, Mr. Little. We are finished. We are toast. If we can't do a simple move, we'll be left back from coast to coast. I've given up all hope now. My body feels the pain, and I see our entire project going right into the drain. Well, just then they both heard a sound. They turned their heads to look around. All the auditions being held here now? Politely said a Jersey cow. No, you're too late, Mr. Pig said. You better just get off the lot. And Mr. Little said, but Moss, what could we lose? Let's give the cow a shot. <laughs> well, the cow stepped to the microphone. She knew just what she had to do. She took a breath. She stood up straight. And she let out a perfect the audience was mesmerized. But when they regained their sense, they burst out into wild applause and shouted compliments. She's amazing. She's fantastic. Who's her agent? She'll go far. It's an Emmy. It's a Grammy. It's an Oscar. She's a star. Well, there you have it, Mr. Little. You know, you didn't have to worry. The problem with you, Little, is you're always in a hurry. You didn't have to tear your hair or to get angry or to shout. I told you everything would be just fine. Glad I could help you out. <laughs> now, just when Mr. Big thought things were going really great, he heard his cell phone ring and felt his pager vibrate. Mr. Big, it's Lynn. Where have you been? Do you know what's going on? We've had problems and disasters every moment since you've gone. Hold your horses, Lynn. I'm on my way to wipe away that frown. 
And as Mr. Big stepped into the morning sun, he said, Lord, I love this town. The end.